So today um, we're talking about safer sex. It's not necessarily safe sex, but it can be safer to go along with our sex education. This is our last topic. Um, so tomorrow we'll do some kind of review and then Friday we'll have a quiz. Maybe you call it a test, but we haven't covered a lot. So maybe it's called a quiz, I don't know. Um, but for now, we need to cover these contraceptions. So what I would like you to do is open up in your Google world, the bio zone. Look, we have lots of things to do. We have a built-in break, um, but right now we're gonna open up this bio zone um, to get a background knowledge before we get started. It looks like this. So just take a minute to read through this, read through this. Look at the pictures, read through this, and there's only the three questions to answer. So while you're doing that, I will take attendance. You might talk to the text by highlighting. You can add, I think highlighting probably is the easiest way to do it. Or making comments, you can highlight and make comments over to the side. That would be a way of talking to the text. Like, oh, that's surprising. Or I remember that from biology from meiosis. Things like that you can do to talk to the text. So the chart, um, if we zoom in here, clearly the female and male portion, um, the method is referring to the form of contraception. So this is pills, abstinence, and a multiple um, selection here. The event is referring to the reproductive process. So um, like the pills are going to interrupt the production of eggs and the release of the eggs, ovulation. So this is like at what point in um, the process that particular contraceptive would work. Tubal ligation, um, that would keep the, the eggs from moving through the fallopian tubes. Any of these is going to stop the fertilization so the sperm cannot meet the egg. So this is um, the process, the reproductive process, and then this like where it enters the process. So this is saying that um, that type of Contraceptive will interfere with that step in the reproductive process is how you would read that. This one was a little bit hard. You might have highlighted this. You're like, what the heck is this? Because we skipped a week of um, content. So that would have covered, been covered in the week we missed. But I might notice it says that no ova, and I know those are eggs, are developed, so must be follicle stimulating hormone has something to do with egg development. So we're like used to annotating on um, paper with pen. So um, going through here, you can underline, you can highlight, you can make notes in the side. So like conception, if that's a new word, um, or you've heard it, but you weren't sure what it was, maybe you define it to yourself. On the side, I said egg plus sperm equals fertilization which is another name for conception. Give me the genesis. We talked about that during meiosis. We talked about spermatogenesis, oogenesis. You might've done some others, but I didn't get through that because I hadn't started. The hormonal contraception, um, most common method. That's probably an important thing. So I highlighted it. There's different versions of it. They um, all interfere with um, hormones that regulate you might not have known these. I'm just going to write a female cycle. So we need estrogen, progesterone, and, and FSH all do specific things. They call thickening of the, of the uterus. They, um, they prepare the body for pregnancy, breast milk, um, and the maturation of the egg in the ovaries. So if you interrupt any of these hormones, then the egg can't mature or there's not gonna be an ovulation. Um, the uterine lining won't thicken and therefore there 
it will be harder for like an egg to implant in it, things like that. Um, so that's how the pills work in general. And then you read about three different kinds, the monophasic, and I decided maybe I wanted to know mono means one. So there's just one level the whole time. Triphasic, there's three different levels, which really um, mimics your natural menstrual cycle a little bit better because the levels of each hormone cycle throughout that um, month period. Mini pills, I thought maybe this was like a teeny tiny pill, but no, it just means that it has a very low dose. So these are things that I wrote on the side. How does this mini pill work? Um, it interferes with the thickening um, of the cervical mucus, preventing endometrial, which is the inner lining of the mm -hmm. uterus, um, endo endometrial thickening. And that's the layer that the egg, the fertilized egg would implant in if, it were, if there was a fertilization. So um, that kind of gives me the background of that. So explain briefly how the combined oral contraceptive pill acts as a contraceptive. So I'm just gonna read this. Um, it provides an artificially high level of reproductive hormones that prevent release of the pituitary hormones, FSH and LH, and induces follicle development and ovulation. Um, and, and maybe we didn't talk about those hormones and we didn't talk about the word feedback, but basically it's tricking your body into thinking it's pregnant. So if your body thinks it's pregnant, it's not going to release another egg. Um, and therefore, if it's not releasing an egg, there's not that chance of fertilization. So that's basically what's happening. Contrasting the OCP, um, which are referring to these oral contraceptives, the combined oral contraceptives with the mini pill over here. So the mini pill only has that progesterone. Um, the OCPs over here, they suppress follicle development. You read that with the FSH, um, and we wrote a note off to the side. So, um, the mini pills, they don't affect the normal cycle. It merely thickens the cervical mucus, preventing entry. So like that, the sperm can't get into the uter uter uterus, the cervix is the opening to the uterus. So the sperm get, can't get through that because of the thick mucus lining. So <clears throat> this isn't affecting your own personal hormone levels, whereas OCPs are. Um, oral contraceptives offer such effective control over contraception. Um, and for me, it's really because it's preventing ovulation. So if there's no egg, there's no fertilization, right? The sperm could be there, but if there's no egg for the sperm to meet with, then, um, then there is not a chance of pregnancy. Now we're gonna talk about these oral contraceptives in a minute. They're not 100% effective and that you really have to um, have a regimen and take them um, at set times and um, under certain, like you can't take them with other, well, you can take them with other medicine, but you have to realize that they're not going to be effective if you're on antibiotics. One of my friends actually, she was married, but still she um, was on medicine and she was taking the pill and she still got pregnant because of the antibiotics. Any questions on this first piece? That was kind of a tif difficult one. So I kind of wanted to walk that one out together. Okay. Do you have any background knowledge on contraceptives? Have they talked about it in your middle school sex ed or any of your other classes? Around the block, you've heard in the halls, people talk about, probably they talk about the, um, you've probably heard of condom, right? You've probably heard of pill. Those are probably the two most common to talk about. Um, have you heard of the shot or the patch or the ring or the diaphragm? So we have a few. Um, we're all gonna have different levels of backgrounds with this, right? Some of us have older siblings. So um, you might've heard your siblings talk about it. Some of us have more open communications with our parents. Um, some of our parents are very comfortable talking about this. 
uh, and other parents are not comfortable talking about this. So we um, have the understanding that we're all coming from different um, places at this point. Basically, we are hoping that you'll better understand the different methods that are available, different times in your life, different methods are maybe more appropriate for you. And um, even if, you know, if you're not sexually active right now, um, that does, this is just teaching you or, or opening the windows or whatever for the future so that you know what is available. So it's important to recognize no birth control except abstinence is 100% fail proof. No barrier method is 100% effective against sexually transmitted diseases either. So I feel like that's usually a test question, like what is the only 100% way to ensure you're not gonna get an STI or pregnant? And that is going to be um, abstinence, right? So here's something when I was doing my research, I was trying to find teen pregnancy rates for 2020, which I didn't find, um, but I like to update my statistics. And I came across this one saying that the teen birth rates are at an all time low. So they've fallen over the last three decades, about 70%. So that's pretty awesome. Um, this is births per thousand females. So in a thousand females, um, there's 17 pregnancies basically. So that's, that's really good. Our numbers are going down, down, down. And um, remember 1990, that's when we instituted the sex education due to HIV. So I can see that we've had quite a decline since then. Um, however, we can do better. So there's still that 17 out of the thousand teens that are getting pregnant and um, realize that when there's a teen pregnant, it's affecting more than that individual, right? It's gonna affect a whole community really. It's gonna affect the entire family. Um, usually the teen is still living at home. And so that's a, another, um, you know, there's just more for the whole entire family to handle. Um, a teen has their own schooling to do. So having a baby can inter interfere with that school. It can interfere with future plans, those sorts of things. So um, you wanna think about all surrounding, you know, not just, oh, there's a baby, they're cute. Um, but what else might it affect? So this is why I say we can do better. Only 9% of sexually active high school students used a condom plus a more effective birth control method the last time they had sex. So to use a common a condom along with another contraceptive method, which you might, might not be familiar with the other options, um, really increases your chance of not transmitting an STI and not um, creating a pregnancy. So to do both is more um, effective. So I'm going to watch this little video because I feel like we need a little background since we didn't go through like human, um, we didn't do the female anatomy or the male anatomy or the menstrual cycle. So um, I'm just going to play out a short piece of this that kind of gives you a quick review of how pregnancy starts. This here is a picture of the female reproductive system. As we saw in the last video, the hormone FSH stimulates an egg in one of the ovaries to develop. And then after about two weeks, the hormone LH triggers the release of that egg, which we call ovulation. It then passes along the adjacent fallopian tube, and at this point it could combine with a sperm cell to form a fertilized egg. If it did, then this fertilized egg would continue along the fallopian tube to the uterus, where it would implant into the wall and slowly develop into a fetus. For reference later on, this part here is the cervix, which is the entrance to the uterus. So as we go through this video and look at all the different methods of contraception, keep thinking back to this process and remember that contraception has to somehow interrupt this process in order to prevent pregnancy. Okay, there's more to that video, but for our purposes, I just wanted that review because that the point was made at the very end that contraception has to prevent one of those steps along the way, either, either prevent 
the release of the egg from the ovaries prevent the fertilization in the fallopian tubes or prevent the implantation in the uterus. So it has to interrupt one of those phases. Do you think I should have played that little clip before you did the biozone? This was a new one for me. I tried to update my videos from time to time as well. Um, so that also talked about those hormones. When we were reading the biozone, we really didn't know what those hormones were. So hopefully we now recognize that the F, SH, follicle stimulating hormone, the egg develops in a follicle. So it makes sense the follicle stimulating hormone would cause development of the egg. Um, and then those, the estrogen and progesterone will um, actually have to do with the uterine lining. So basically there's three different contraceptive um, processes. They can prevent ovulation, they can prevent fertilization, or they can prevent implantation. And that's what we, we just mentioned. So keep the sperm and egg away from each other. There will be no um, fertilization. Recognize that even if you're using one of these methods or two of these methods, no birth control will be successful if you forget to use it or if you use it incorrectly. So of course, we're gonna kind of go through the pros and cons of each of these, what they are and why you would choose one or not choose one. Um, so you're probably familiar with what abstinence is. It's simply deciding not to do something, right? You could be abstinent with Mountain Dew and choosing not to drink Mountain Dew. In this case, we're referring to abstinence with um, intercourse. So you're making the decision not to have intercourse and sticking with it. So delaying sexual relationships until one is ready to make a responsible decision and all that comes with it. Make a decision and stick with it. Talk to your partner about it, right? If the two of you are not on the same page, abstinence is going to be very difficult. So the pros and cons. It's the only 100% effective method against both STIs and pregnancies. There is no risk of an STD. It's free. You don't have to buy it. It's always available. You don't got to go to a doctor to get it. You don't have to go to the store to get it. It's always on hand. Um, the con didn't, the word con didn't show up. It must be in white. Um, is that it can be hard to stick with the decision. Anything we do, right? If I said, I'm not gonna have Mountain Dew for the next 40 days, that could be difficult to stick to. Um, so that's true of any decision you make. You also have pressures. Like you say, I am not gonna give the kid my homework, right? But they pressure you. And it's hard to say no to your friends after they ask you enough time, right? So the abstinence method can be difficult when there's pressure involved. And hopefully we recognize like if we have a good relationship, then there won't be pressures, right? You kind of go at the pace of the slower person. <clears throat> so the first one we'll talk about is the oral contraceptive pill, which is what you guys read about in your biozone. So it contains a synthetic estrogen progesterone. So estrogen is what is released um, to like thicken the uterine lining as well as begin the um, milk production for pregnancies. So by releasing estrogen into the body, your body thinks it already is pregnant. So this happens after an egg is released. So it also suppresses LH and FSH, which these two are needed for the egg to be released. And they will be low when you're pregnant because your body doesn't want to release a second egg. So this is basically simulating a pregnancy. Um, so there's different, different forms of the pill, as you saw in the warm-up. Um, you can take a pill a day for three weeks. Then there's no pill in the fourth week. That's one way. Um, this is usually like your period week. Um, and then you restart again with the next pack or you don't stop between the packs. So this one, you would take the pill every single day. This is maybe easier to keep on track because you're like me with recycling. Every other week is recycling week and I can't remember which week I'm on. So if you were to stop your pills, you might forget what day you started again. Um, the the contraceptive pills, you can't just go to the store and get, they're hormonal. And, um, and 
and you have to go to a doctor or some other healthcare provider to get a prescription for them. Here's some advantages. They can be very effective, 99.9% .9 if used perfectly every time. Like I said, antibiotics will affect them. The time of day that you take them will affect them. So they have to be taken at the same time every single day. So that's where perfectly every time, sometimes we fluctuate. Like if you take them when you um, get up in the morning, most of us are getting up at the same time every single day, but on the weekend, we get up maybe later or on Wednesday, maybe we get up later. And when you're in college, some days you'll have eight o'clock classes and sometimes you have 10 o'clock classes. And again, it's gonna be later some days than other days. So that's not perfect. So that's every time you do that, if you take it at a different time, you're lowering the effectiveness um, percentage. They are, however, convenient. You get them and you can count on them and they're always there. They don't interfere with sex. You don't have to say, whoa, time out. I got to go take my pill. Um, they can even diminish um, menstrual cramps, acne. Um, some disadvantage is that they don't protect you against STDs, right? So if you are on the pill, you're still going to want something that protects you from an STD. Effectiveness may be decreased by use of other medications. The antibiotic is a very good example. If you're on an antibiotic, you have to wait a full month before you're, you can count on your pills to be effective again. Um, so we said it's 99.9% .9 effective. There's a typical failure rate of about 9%. Um, so it's important to, to um, realize that. That's like the typical use rather than the perfect use. Side effects may include nausea, weight gain, headaches, missed periods, darkened skin on the face, or depression. So if you were to um, be on the pill or to get a prescription for the pill, if any of these side effects um, are occurring, you want to go back to your doctor. There are different versions of the pills, so maybe another version would work better for you. The condom um, is a sheath of rubber shaped to snugly fit over the erect penis. So it prevents sperm from getting inside the, the vagina during intercourse. So this would be considered a barrier method. It's preventing the egg and the sperm from um, meeting, right? So that's where it interferes with the process. Condoms should be placed on the erect penis before the penis has any contact with the vagina because once it has, it already has a chance of, remember we talked about there's that pre-seminal fluid. So STIs or sperm could be in that pre-seminal fluid. After ejaculation, the penis should be removed from the vagina immediately and thrown in the trash, not in the garbage, or I mean, sorry, not gone down the um, toilets. So if you're trying to be sneaky, that's bad because it can back up the toilet and cause really big problems. So we're gonna show a short uh, video on how to put on a condom correctly, because again, doing things perfect increases their effectiveness, making mistakes decreases their effectiveness. Expect the expiration date on the pack. Should be an air bubble. said, don't use scissors. I'm going to back it up. Don't use scissors because you might accidentally snip it, right? So you want to push the condom away from the corner and tear from the corner. Notice there's a, an air pocket above the tip, so you don't pull it all the way down. Notice, um, oops, notice the rim here. The roll is on the outside, not on the inside. the tip. That gives room for the semen to be collected at the end. Roll it down, make sure there's no tears. If you're going to use lubrication, um, you want to make sure to use a water-based or silicone-based um, lubrication, like oils can break down the tissue of the 
condom and therefore make it ineffective. Never reuse a condom. That'd just be yucky. Okay, so that's that. IUDs are one of the most effective types of one birth moment, control. Please. Let's separate myth from fact. Are intrauterine devices safe? Yes, they're safe. It'll go through all of the choices there, but that's all we needed from that. So they can be 97% effective when used correctly and consistently every time. So again, you saw a lot of the correctness, making sure that it's not out of date, making sure there's an air pocket, pushing the condom away from the corner that you're going to tear. Don't tear it with your teeth or use scissors that might, um, might tear the condom. You don't wanna keep it um, in a warm place. Like don't leave it out in your car in the summer. Again, that heat will break down the, um, the material. Keeping it in your pocket and then you're sitting on your pocket over and over again creates friction, which can um, cause it to tear. Putting it in your purse with every other item. You got scissors or probably not scissors, but maybe you have pins or something in there. Keys that could puncture it or create tears through friction. Um, if you're hiding it you know, in between your mattresses, again, there's friction there that can cause little tearing of the condom. So all of that goes into proper use. You wanna keep it at a, at a pretty stable temperature you're, um, and then protect it from accidental tearing, I guess. Don't use two at once. You might think that's a good idea. Um, you're like, I'm double protected but it's just gonna increase friction and friction causes tearing. So the typical failure rate is 18%. So that's how you typically use it versus if you're using it perfectly. Um, do not use oil-based lubricants. We talked about that. Um, so some examples of this would be oils, like baby oil or lotions, um, petroleum jelly, that would be like Vaseline um, with any of your latex columns, condoms. Um, they'll weaken the condom, causing it to tear or break. So let's see, did I miss anything? Oh, other parts of just using it properly, right? So remember to leave that air pocket at the top and to roll from the outside. There's also a female condom. Um, the female condom right here is a little bit larger in size. Um, so you can use it, uh, the female can use it, kind of gives the female control over her own choices. It can be placed in advance, I think up to eight hours, could be six, but I think it's eight. Um, but you would insert it like a diaphragm, which we haven't mentioned yet, but also like a tampon, I guess. So you, it has this flexible ring on it and you would um, pinch the ring and then um, insert it similar to a tampon. This is newer on the market. I mean, it's not, new, new, but it's probably not talked about as much as the male condom. Um, and so I will show you a demo on this one too. And they're gonna use a little model to demonstrate because it's, it's a little bit different than putting it on a, a penis. The penis is kind of easy to figure out. It's like a stick, you know? The female's body is a little, a little different. So let's look at that. This is a female condom. Before opening the female condom, you wanna make sure you store it at a room temperature area. And before opening, you also wanna make sure you check the expiration date and make sure it's not expired. Before you open the condom, you wanna make sure the seal is not broken. If it is broken, then you wanna dispose of the current condom and grab a new one. So when you open the female condom, take it out. And there's two rings with the female condom. Before inserting, there's an elastic ring that you're going to pinch and then you're going to guide it through the vagina and all the way until it covers the entire <coughs> cervix. During intercourse, you wanna make sure the outer ring is covering the labia and that you insert the penis through the condom and that it doesn't slip alongside the condom into the vagina. You also wanna make sure you don't use a female condom with a male condom. You should only use one or the other. After ejaculation, you're going to twist the outer ring and to remove, you would pull through the vagina and dispose of it in the trash can. It comes in a package, so you want to make sure um, it's not expired. You want to make sure there's that air pocket because that's kind of a 
indicator that all is well. Um, Can I ask you a question? Why did you get back? So keep going. Don't use um, the female condom and the male condom because that would be the same as using a double condom, right? So that creates friction. Um, so the thing with, the, with this is it's really going to protect the cervix because it creates like that, that top ring is, is um, it's a flexible ring, but then the sheet of material is constant across there, right? It's not like an open end. So that's going to protect the cervix, the vagina, and the external genitalia as well. So that helps against um, some of those skin-to-skin -skin STIs that we talked about. It doesn't require the male erection for use, so you can put it in in advance. There are no serious side effects. 95% effective if used consistently and correctly, and it can protect against um, all, S not all STDs, I just meant the categories. Um, it can protect against STDs, HIV, as well as pregnancy. Um, some downfalls, it's a one-time use. They're more expensive than a male condom, um, maybe because there's more material that goes into making them. Um, so they're like two and a half a piece. And the typical use failure rate is 21%. So a little bit of a higher um, failure rate. So this is that second. We said if you use a condom, you should use another um, form. So you could use the condom in the pill. You can also use the condom as well as a spermicide. So they come in several forms. There's foam, gels, creams. You can see here suppositories, which are like pills that, like bullet sized pills that um, would you would put into the vagina and then it um, releases the spermicide. So sperm, the side part is like um, killer, right? So this is a sperm killer basically. So you can place these in the vagina in advance um, about an hour before intercourse. And it can be um, left, you wanna leave it in there for six to eight hours after intercourse. So this will kill off any sperm that are in that canal so that they don't continue on into the cervix through the uterus and into the fallopian tubes where fertilization occurs. A common uh, spermicide is monoxonol 9. Kills the sperms and acts as a physical barrier so that foam will kind of expand and block the cervix so that um, the sperm can't get through. So they can be, it can be 90 to 97% effective if you use correctly and consistently. So again, following the directions, right? If it's good, like if you can put it in in an hour in advance, that's it, right? You don't wanna do it eight hours in advance and then expect it to be effective. Um, easily acquired, like you can buy it in, in the aisles at the store, um, provides a good lubrication as well, which decreases friction, um, can be used with a condom. So there's a number of different kinds. There's a cervical cap, a sponge, a foam, other, other examples. Typical failure rate is 28%. Some find it inconvenient or messy. Some women experience vaginal irritation and some men experience penile irritation. So just like with any thing that you put on your skin. Some of us are gonna be sensitive and some of us aren't, right? So um, that can be a downfall if you're, if you're sensitive to the material. Both methods used at the same time, the condom with the foam. Uh, the foam must be inserted within 30 minutes before intercourse. So the female takes care of that and then the male can take care of the condom. Must be placed on the erect penis prior to contact with the vagina prevents the sperm from getting into the uterus by killing the sperm and preventing the sperm from getting out into the vagina. So advantages close to 100% when used together. Effective if both are used correctly with every act of intercourse. Excellent protection against STDs. Um, both methods can be purchased at the store without a prescription. So those are all bonuses. Um, some disadvantages requires more effort than some couples like and interrupts intercourse. So you gotta be like, oh, wait a second. I gotta put my condom on and I gotta get my foam ready. This is a diaphragm. So a diaphragm is used by a female. It is fitted for the female by a doctor. 
and um, it would be inserted much like the um, female condom. Shallow rubber cap, and you can fill the cap with that spermicide, whether it be a jelly um, or a cream. And then the rubber cap will like fit over the cervix. So it keeps the sperm from entering the cervix and therefore it can't get into the uterus and can't get into the fallopian tubes. So there'll be um, no fertilization. Also kills the um, sperm because of the spermicide that you're using in the cap. So it can be 97% effective when used right and consistent, consistently. Can be inserted up to two hours in advance. So no interruption, right? Must stay in place for at least six hours after the last intercourse. Um, they can be very effective and safe, low cost, adds extra lubrication. So remember we talked about different, different methods will be more appropriate for different times in your life, right? Um, when we're younger, we might not be um, comfortable with the, our internal bodies. And so some of these methods might sound like, whoa, that's not something I'm really wanting to do. But maybe when you're older, then um, you have a different opinion of it. Um, so typical failure rate, about 12%. Again, that spur the side could be irritating to some skins. Can be associated with toxic shock syndrome. So look for symptoms of fever, vomiting, diarrhea, and rash. If any of those happened, it's kind of like, the chemical is poisoning. Um, some women find it difficult to insert, messy or inconvenient. So the patch is kind of cool. Um, similar to the pill, it's a hormonal method, but rather than taking it orally, you just stick it on um, a part of your body. It might be on your hip or your stomach or your shoulder. And they're good for a whole week. So if you have trouble remembering to take your pill every day at the same time, a patch could be a good thing. So it's an adhesive patch. It has the hormones in it. The hormones are released and then they enter your bloodstream through the skin. Um, kind of looks like a Band-Aid. And then you wear one each week. So you would put a second one on, a third one on, and then you don't need to wear one during your period week, during the fourth week. So here's some examples of what it looks like um, and locations that you might wear it. <clears throat> it doesn't work as well for larger people um, as there's more tissue for the hormone to, to go through. So if used correctly, it's 99% effective, maybe less effective if patients are, um, are larger. Typical failure rate, again, like how you typically use it, 9%. Uh, no protection against STDs. All you're doing is interfering with the female ovulation. Um, side effects similar to those of the pill. Since it is hormonal, that makes sense. May experience some spotting or breakthrough bleeding during the first few cycles till your body gets used to it. Can cause nausea, skin irritation, breast discomfort. Here's the ring. And this is like the top of the diaphragm or the top of the female condom, I said, is like a flexible ring. So you can see, you can pinch it. So this ring is inserted into the vagina just um, below the cervix. Um, and it releases hormones like the pill, like the patch, but it stays in for three weeks. So the patch is for a week, the pill is for a month, basically. And again, you don't have to wear it during that period week and then you'd get another ring for the next month. So even better if you have trouble remembering things. Can be 99% effective, typical failure rate is 9%. Again, it's hormonal, it interferes with ovulation, it does not protect against STDs or STIs. Same side effects as the other hormonal, um, hormonal methods. Then you have the Depo-Provera shot, even longer term. Again, this is a hormonal method, but um, it is in a shot in the arm or in the buttock, and you would get it every 12 weeks. So the patch is for a week, the ring is for a month, and the shot is for three months. And then this is often just referred to as the shot. Again, works by keeping the egg from being released. 
and also thickening the cervical mucus, which um, keeps the sperm from getting through. It's a good method if you want a method that is long-term, very effective. You don't wanna deal with taking a pill every day. You don't wanna deal with take, changing that patch. Um, or if you want to spur, like to space out your births, like a married couple, um, if you can't take estrogen. So like some of those pills I said, if it's not working for you, you wanna go to your doctor, there's different versions. Um, it can be 99.7% effective. Again, no protection against STDs. Failure rate about 6% may not be able to get pregnant for up to a year after last use. So again, different times in your life. Like in your, if you're in college, maybe you don't wanna get pregnant the entire time you're in college, so that's cool. But if you're married, um, and you might want to get married or um, you might want to have a baby in the next year, then you might not want this method. So different times in your life, different methods will be more appropriate. There can be problems that include irregular bleeding in many forms, which is typical with any of those hormonals, right? Um, you'll, you can have fewer periods, lighter periods. Those sound like good things. Um, most have no periods after five years of use. So repetitive use um, can produce amenorrhea. A is not or without menses. So amenorrhea, no, no period. Um, side effects can last up to eight months past the last use. There's also an IUD. This is an IUD. It's really smaller than it looks. Some of the pictures you can see it on a hand and it looks very small. So it's a small piece of plastic with copper wire wrapped around. I should change this to a colored picture so you can see the copper. The copper wire is wrapped around um, the progestin. So it has a hormone in it. Um, there's a nylon thread attached to it. Your doctor will place it. So you have to go to the doctor, like getting a pap smear. Um, and they would implant it basically into the uterus. It pretty much makes the uterus a place an egg would not want to implant. It's like um, a hostile environment, perhaps you could say. Um, so it interferes with the uterine lining. Um, it'll interfere with your hormonal regulation, that sort of thing. So um, it cannot be used by all women. You can see right here, it's placed in the uterus. And then um, you can see the strings will come out into the vagina. This is the cervix. Okay, so it's about, um, it's pretty effective. There's a failure rate of only like less than 1%. It's always there. You don't have to plan ahead. You don't have to go hmm, in the next six hours, maybe I'm gonna have sex. You don't have to worry about changing it every month or three months or years. Um, you're going to leave it in depending on the version you get. It could be a 10 year. It could be a five year. It could be a one year. Um, usually it's not felt by either partner, even though it's um, in your uterus, you, you typically don't feel it. And the male should not feel it either. Um, it does not protect, protect, see there, it's not so big. Um, it does not protect, protect against STDs. Again, it's more hormonal and um, just the environment of the uterus. The side effects or complications can include, include cramps, bleeding, or spotting. Again, those were common with the other hormonal methods. Um, you could get infections of the tubes or uterus, which may be serious. My cousin actually had one of these and it went through the uterine wall. That was bad. She had to get it like surgically moved. But that's not typical. Okay, so this um, slide here is showing you the effectiveness of the different methods. Um, sexually active teens should use condoms to prevent sexually transmitted diseases and consider using another type of birth control to further reduce the risk of pregnancy. So condom and a pill or condom and a spermicide. Um, so, most effective, less than one pregnancy per 100 women. Least effective, 18 or more pregnancies per 100 women. So these are some behavioral methods like the withdrawal method or the pull-out method, trying to pull out before ejaculation. The rhythm method having to do with um, 
like counting the days on the calendar, those are less effective. Um, we can see these are more effective. So any of the hormonal ones are more effective than the barriers, basically. Okay. What questions do you have? We have two things left. And now I realize I should have done my break sooner because it seems awkward to take a break for now when you're going to be gone in 15 minutes. But feel free if you need to go to the bathroom, get up and do that. The next thing on our list is this contraceptive worksheet, which I wrote 20 minutes, but it probably isn't going to take you 20 minutes to do. So you have these different methods that we talked about. And then you're marking how they work. You can copy paste my X if you want. Um, you're marking who would use it, the male, the female, or both. Do you get it at the store? Do you have to get it from a doctor? Um, do they protect against STDs? And then the percent effectiveness. We'll get that one done today. And then I have a CK12 for you to do later.